This video is an introduction to functions. In particular, I'm going to talk about what an injective, surjective, and bijective function are. These names sound very technical and quite daunting, and truth be told, I had some difficulty when I first came across these concepts and had to keep checking what each of them meant. So hopefully I can do a good job of explaining what they are simply, because they are simple ideas. So let's get into talking about what a function is. Many of you, when you think about what a function is, are probably thinking of something along the lines of y equals 2 times x. This is a relationship between two variables, y and x, and it says that the variable y is always going to be two times whatever the value of the variable x is. But this isn't exactly the best way to think about what a function is. There's a better notation that I think makes understanding what a function is actually doing much more intuitive. And that's by writing f of x is equal to 2x. So this is exactly the same thing, y equals 2x, but written in a slightly different way. And the way it's written gives us more of a clue as to what is actually going on here. You see that this function takes as an input the value x and produces as an output the value 2x. So it's taking something in, it's applying some operation to it, and it's giving us an output. And the fact that x appears on both sides of the equation tells you that there's some relationship between what's going in and what's going out. And what that relationship is, is that the actual mechanics of the function. And now a natural question to ask is, well, what kind of things does the function take as an input and what kind of things does it spit out as an output? So in this case, we understand that x is standing in for some number. And so, for example, if we give the function the input of 5, f of 5 is going to be equal to 2 times 5, which is 10. So the function is taking in a number and it's spitting out a number. And it's not clear what would happen if we tried to input something that wasn't a number. What does f of apple mean, for example? So we have to place some kind of restrictions on what exactly a function can accept as an argument and what it can produce. And these restrictions are enforced by means of sets. Remember that a set is just a collection of objects. And we say that the input of the function can only come from a certain set and that the output of the function can only belong to a certain set. The set of inputs to the function is called the domain of the function, and the set of outputs of the function is called the range of the function. When we define a function, we have to say what set the function draws elements from, and what set it produces elements for. So we write that a function is going to take objects in set A into objects in set B. And in this way, you can see that a function is defining a relationship between the two sets, between the set A and between the set B. Let's give an example using a set that I introduced in my video on set theory. Let the set A be composed of apple, banana, orange, and pear. So what kind of relationship can we talk about when it comes to a function that accepts fruit as an input? Well, one thing we might want to know is the cost of that fruit. So we're going to input into the function the name of a fruit, and the function is going to output how much that fruit costs. Let's create a set B that contains a range of possible prices. Say B is the set that contains 20p, 40p, 60p, 80p, and a pound. Okay, and we want our function to tell us how much each fruit costs. So let's say, for example, that f of apple is going to be 40p. We can write down the function as usual, but we can also represent it by drawing an arrow we can draw an arrow from apple in set A to 40p in set B. All right, now let's say f of banana is 20p. So we draw the arrow again from banana to 20p. f of orange, say so that's 80p. Now, are we done defining our function? No, because there's still an element in A that hasn't been assigned a value yet. So if we did f of pear, we wouldn't know what it meant. So the function doesn't know what value to output if we try and put pear in the input. But that was the whole point of restricting ourselves to a certain set of inputs in the first place. So let's say f of pear is 80p. There's no reason why orange and pear can't cost the same. Let's have a look at what we've done here. We've said that two arrows pointing to a single element in b is fine. Let's call it a greedy element. And all it means is that there's two elements in a that cost the same. But what we can't do is we can't have two arrows coming from one element in a. So for example, if pair not only went to 80p, but also went to one pound, then this would no longer be a function. That's because our function has to be unambiguous in the output it delivers. If there were two arrows coming from pair, how would we know whether the output is going to be 80p or one pound? 
So each element in A is only going to have one arrow leaving from it. But again, it's okay for one element in B to have two arrows leading towards it. And also, there are some lonely elements in B that don't have any arrows pointing towards them. That's fine, we don't necessarily have to have a fruit that costs 60p or one pound. But we did say every element in A has to have an arrow pointing away from it. Alright, brilliant. So now we have an idea of what a function really is. And what we can do is we can begin to categorise these functions into different types, according to how they behave. And that's where these words, injective, surjective and bijective come in. Let's see what each one means. An injective function is a function where there's only ever one arrow going into any element in B. In other words, there are no greedy elements in B. That means we can't have the situation that we have in our original function, where we have two arrows pointing in towards ATP. We only need to make a slight change to make our original function an injective function. That's by, say, changing the value of f of orange from ATP to 60p. But by making this change, we've changed what the function is actually doing. And so we should give the function a different name. Let's call the function g. Functions are usually denoted by the letter f, just because it's easy to remember that it stands for function. But once we've used the letter f, we need to come up with another letter. So g is a perfectly fine letter to use for a function. So now we have a function g that's still going from sets a to b, except where g of orange is now equal to 60p. And g is an injective function because there's no element in b that has two arrows pointing to it. A surjective function is one that doesn't have any lonely elements in b. And that means that there are no elements in b without anything pointing towards them. So everything in b has to have something pointing towards it. We can convert our original function into a surjective function just by removing those elements from b that don't have an arrow pointing towards them. Since we haven't changed what the function's doing to each of the inputs, does that just mean we can continue to use f as the name of our function? We've actually changed the set b. We've removed two elements from b. And so this set that the function is going into is a different set. So really this shouldn't be b, but this set should have a new name, let's say c. And so now we have a function that's going to go from a to c. And because what set the function takes as an input and what set the function takes as an output is an intrinsic part of that function, then we also have to accept that this is going to be a different function. Let's continue along the alphabet and call this function h. Now we have the definition of an injective function and a surjective function. All that's left is to define a bijective function. But we've already done all of the work, because a bijective function is simply a function that's both injective and surjective. That is, a function where there's no elements in B that don't have any arrows pointing towards them, and there are no elements in B which have more than one arrow pointing towards it. So B doesn't have either lonely elements or greedy elements. So you can see that the function g is very close to being bijective. There's just one element in b that doesn't have any arrow pointing towards it. So let's simply remove that element from the set, like we did to define our surjective function. But remember, that means renaming the set. So we have our new function i that goes from a to d, but otherwise is exactly the same as the function g. Another name for a bijective function is an invertible function. I like using the word invertible a lot more because it's a lot more descriptive. It's telling us what exactly is special about function i. You see, i is not just defining a function that goes from a to d, but it's also defining a function that goes from d to a. If I invert all of these arrows, instead of having the arrows pointing from the set a into the set d, we instead have them pointing from the set d into the set a, you can see that we've created a new function, and that new function is called the inverse of i, or i inverse. And this new function takes as inputs elements from the set d, and produces as outputs elements of the set a. So it's answering the question, what costs 40p? In which case the answer would be apple. You can see why it's necessary for the bijective function to be both injective and surjective. Because if it wasn't injective, then when we try to flip these arrows, we're going to have two arrows pointing out of a single element in B. Then I inverse wouldn't be a proper function. And equally, if there were any elements in B that didn't have an arrow pointing out of them, then we also couldn't have this function. I've covered all of the new concepts I wanted to in this video, but in the next video I'm going to talk about injective, surjective and bijective functions, and other ways of representing them. 
If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below. And thank you for watching the video.